Howdy doodly, welcome back to ML News. What has happened? Almost nothing. It's so quiet in the world. Oh no, <laughs> everything is going on at the same time. I swear I cannot keep the lures of the different stories apart anymore. A lot of crazy stuff happening. We have a lot to get through, so strap in. First story, Elon Musk sues OpenAI. I'm not sure at this point whether to him this is a serious point of actually winning a lawsuit, whether he uses it for some sort of leverage or whether it's just a publicity stunt. In any case, Elon Musk has sued OpenAI mainly on the grounds that they have essentially broken their obligations that they laid down in their founding documents, essentially saying they were conceived as a non-profit to the benefit of everyone, but then they became a for-profit and now it's mainly a product company and they did take advantage of that in a lot of ways. You can read the whole lawsuit. The whole lawsuit is fairly lengthy, as you can see right here. I'll link to it in the description. But in essence, the allegations are around criticism of OpenAI and how they handle their how they came to be versus how they are now like open versus closed. There's a lot of stuff in that lawsuit. So uh, the part of the lawsuit is about this Q star algorithm that was hinted at during the episode where Sam Altman left open or was forced to leave open AI that Q star is an algorithm that somehow was in the making and is so good. What Elon wants is the court to classify QSTAR and, and GPT-4 as AGI, which would mean that Microsoft could not profit off of OpenAI anymore. I'm going to be a bit inaccurate in what I say here in terms of legal language, but essentially the contracts between Microsoft and OpenAI is such that OpenAI said, we need some money to develop AGI. Anything before AGI, like anything on our way there, like the image creation models, the LLMs that write nice emails and so on, anything before that Microsoft can use and commercially exploit and so on. And in return, they invest a lot of money into us. However, once we reach AGI, which then is determined by, I guess, the board or, or something, it's in their founding documents. Once we reach AGI or it's in their agreement with Microsoft, at that point, Microsoft Microsoft can no longer sort of dictate the commercial direction of that because once AGI is reached, it should be for the benefit of all of humanity. Like in essence, once AGI is reached, OpenAI will kind of release it. Part of this lawsuit here is what they already have, already AGI, which obviously has very competing interests right here. Like the people who want to continue this commercial trajectory will argue, no, 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 this is not AGI yet. It's just on the way to AGI. Whereas the people who want things to become open and available and this commercial direction to end will argue, yes, this is AGI and therefore stop the commercialization, make it available. This is part of the lawsuit. It goes hand in hand with OpenAI being initially non for profit and now for profit. And it is true, it is true that at the beginning, OpenAI got a lot of sympathy because they said, we're an open company, we do open source stuff, we make non profit stuff, and so on. And we'll come to that later. They use this as a tool to gain a lot of policy changes in their favor. They use this as as a tool to get a lot of recruitment. And then they performed this pivot, which I guess in crypto would be called a rug pull. They did change quite drastically. There is another component to this someone and I have not verified this myself. So it could be a fake. But people went to look at the sparks, the sparks of AGI paper. And in the source code in the LaTeX source code, it says something like first contact with an AGI system. This would essentially mean that Microsoft themselves have kind of admitted this is AGI. Now, to be frank, this is an artistic choice of a title. I know the legal system is silly and the legal system would totally do something like say, oh, this is definite proof they knew it was AGI. Like, no, they just we're looking for a cool title to put here. Okay, still, it could be that Microsoft kind of self owned 
in this way. But who knows? Who knows? It's going to be up to a judge, which I'm not sure will ever happen because lawsuits tend to fizzle out before. They also released uh, statements from Microsoft CEO who apparently throughout the Sam Altman drama said something like, it would not matter if OpenAI disappeared tomorrow explaining that Microsoft has all the IP rights and all the capability. They have the people, they have the compute, they have the data, they have everything. We are below them, above them, around them. Very cool, very villain-esque speech there. Apparently, Microsoft feeling pretty comfy in the position that they are in. And the lawsuit is trying to kind of make the point that OpenAI, the original, you know, lofty goals nonprofit has been more and more been clawed in by this corporation who wants to make profit and wants everything just for the benefit for themselves. There are lawyers coming in, weighing in. Some lawyers are like, there could be some merit to the claims and so on, where other lawyers say something like, oh, this is a losing case against OpenAI. A tech lawyer says legally, there's no contract breach and so on. And I always find these lawyer opinions a, a bit hard to estimate like I'm not a lawyer myself. But I know that Elon Musk is somewhat of a magnet of like people just falling into rage. Like Some people just whenever Elon says or does something, it's automatically bad and the worst and not good. And for sure, the guy has a certain level of criticism is justified, but it makes it all the harder to estimate which of these things. And this phenomenon tends to happen, especially with like journalists and lawyers, among others, where it's just, well, whatever Elon does is bad. And you know, lawyers, they're, they're trained to argue their side. <laughs> they're legitimately trained to do that and to make their side sound as being as much right as possible. Very, very tricky to estimate who actually has a solid grasp on the legal concepts here. Probably there's pros and against and so on. There's an article from VentureBeat that has a bit more of a nuanced perspective saying that it might be a long shot, but it might reveal some very interesting facts and, and apparently makes a strong policy argument. In, at the same time, the SEC probes whether OpenAI investors were misled. The US regulator studying internal communications by CEO Sam Altman in relation to his ouster from the post in November. The SEC sent a subpoena to the company in December. Altman had, hadn't been consistently candid in his communications. The question is now in what way has he not been consistently candid in his communications? Among the funny bits here is who do you even sue? in this sense. And the question is answered by this section of the lawsuit. So Sam Altman is being sued, Greg Brockman, OpenAI Inc, OpenAI LP, OpenAI LLC, OpenAI GP LLC, OpenAI Opco LLC, OpenAI Global LLC, OAI Corporation LLC, OpenAI Holdings LLC, and some people. OpenAI tax optimizing the crap out of this. I'm wondering if like GPT-4 has helped come up with this company structure. You be sure they're not paying a single cent to any of the governments involved here. Which one of you is supposed to be open and not for profit? <laughs> yeah, if you know where this is from, I got you. Among the more bizarre things, OpenAI themselves released a blog post titled OpenAI and Elon Musk. We are dedicated to the OpenAI mission and have pursued it every step of the way. This details a series of explanations and uh, largely emails between Elon Musk and the OpenAI team that's currently still there, or most of it who is currently still there, detailing how Elon came into OpenAI, how they discussed fairly early on that a for profit structure might be necessary. And in one email, even Elon said something like yes, to that, which they now take as evidence that see even Elon agreed that we might want to do a for profit structure. Their story goes on by saying that Elon has then requested to essentially become the CEO of this more for profit oriented business and be given sort of large leeway. And when that was denied, he took off out of OpenAI, said they had no chance. If they don't want to do this within the Tesla umbrella, 
which he would dictate. They would have no capital to do this and therefore would have no chance of being successful. He said something like, we need to go with a much bigger number than 100 million to avoid sounding hopeless relative to Google or Facebook. I think we should start with a 1 billion funding commitment. I will cover whatever anyone else doesn't provide and so on. So that's Elon. And there seems to be a general discussion that, okay, if we don't get more money, we're not going to be able to compete with like the Googles and the Facebooks and so on. And therefore, a for profit structure might be necessary. This goes as far back as like 2016, 2017, 2018, as you can see from these emails right here. And the story from OpenAI side is that when they didn't agree to do this under Tesla and leaving Elon Musk as being the CEO, then Elon took off. And now he's kind of salty that he didn't get to do that. And now that's why he's suing them now. But he was always on board with the for profit thing. So now him claiming that, oh, they changed their mission and so on is not genuine. Among the more interesting emails is one from Ilya Sutskever coming out here. And this one says the article is concerned with the hard takeoff scenario. So an article they send around if a hard takeoff occurs and a safe AI is harder to build than an unsafe one, then by open sourcing everything, we make it easy for someone unscrupulous with access to overwhelming amount of hardware to build an unsafe AI, which will experience a hard takeoff. As we get closer to building AI, it will make sense to start being less open. The open in open AI means that everyone should benefit from the fruit after AI is built or from the fruits of AI. But it is totally okay not to share the science, even though sharing everything is definitely the right strategy in the short and possibly medium term for recruitment purposes. So this really confirms that what essentially everyone has been saying all this time that they initially and this was 2016, right? The delusions of, of kind of all oh, AGI is just around the corner and, and so on. But this confirms what everyone has been saying saying that OpenAI has essentially at the beginning been pulling up this, oh, we're so open, we're so great, we're so nonprofit in order to recruit a lot of talent, in order to attract a lot of regulatory goodwill and policies in their favor, and then doing a hard pivot, as you will, instead of the hard takeoff scenario. Reading this from Ilya in 2016 is not surprising, but it is quite astounding that so far back, it was already doomed to become what it is today and to not last. Then Elon responds saying, yep, essentially acknowledging this. So that's OpenAI's position that Elon was on board with this pivot and is now just salty that he's not the leader of it. I disagree with this part right here. The we are dedicated to the OpenAI mission and have pursued it every step of the way. I think we can all agree that is not the case. I, I think we can all agree on that. They do have their reasoning saying, oh, we realized we need more capital. And because we needed more capital, we made this deal with Microsoft and so on. But I doubt if you had asked most of them at the very beginning, and you ask them what that mission entails and doesn't entail, they probably wouldn't have said these kinds of things. And if they had, I'm quite convinced that most of the people that received their communication, like the way they communicated towards the outside, most people didn't understand it as that. And I think that's the important part, even if the people knew the way they communicated did not reflect that. So for sure, they can now say, we always knew what the open AI mission was, and so on. But it's not so easy. Interestingly, uh, their anonymization techniques for these is that they kind of left the word like the length of the words inside of these emails. So you can see how many letters the words had. And therefore, people are now trying to sort of crowdsource disambiguating these and de-anonymizing these just by seeing like which words make sense in combination and fit into the gaps right here. <laughs> so it's pretty, pretty neat, pretty neat, I have to say. All right, on to bigger topics. Mistral is releasing Mistral Large. Uh, Mistral Large is a new model that's currently available behind the Mistral API. It is performing quite well compared to others in the in the domain, although we have just seen in the last video, Claude three is now out and is either matching GPT four or very close to it. Nevertheless, Mistral is probably a much a bit of a smaller model that still holds its hand, holds its fire 
to the larger models. They also release a chat inference service on top of their models. And even though the model is currently only available behind an API, they have said that they are going to continue releasing stuff open source in the future. So we'll keep an eye out for that. Interestingly, Microsoft has announced a partnership with Mistral, that being that Mistral models are going to be available in Microsoft Azure platform. Microsoft customers can consume these models, not just via the Mistral API, but also via the Microsoft APIs. People have already been like, oh no, is this going to be a repeat of OpenAI first? We're seeing models only being available behind APIs and now second Microsoft coming in and Microsoft has even invested into Mistral. They have even deleted their section on open models, but they have put it back. They've just changed their website around and then this part was no longer there. And then now this, this part is again there. So don't worry quite yet. Arthur Munch saying we are still committed to leading open weight models. We ask for a little patience. H100's only got us this far. And on the topic of Microsoft, he says, we have a reselling agreement with Microsoft that we're very excited about. It will accelerate our growth. And they only invested a small convertible note alongside many other companies as a distribution partner. We're an independent European company with global ambitions. Everyone briefly freaked out being like, oh, they have portrayed themselves as a European company and now Microsoft invests into them. So this is not European at all. But I mean, come on, what are you going to do? Not sell to Microsoft? <laughs> So all in all, it's definitely worth keeping an eye on Mistral and how this is going to develop. Even this company will need to make money and probably a lot of money to not only justify its current investment level, but also keep staying relevant. On the other hand, it's not like Microsoft took it over already. So we'll keep an eye on it, but there's no reason to freak out just now. A couple of cases of espionage. Very interesting. Chinese national residing in California arrested for theft of artificial intelligence related trade secrets from Google. This person apparently was in teams surrounding ML infrastructure, specifically hardware infrastructure, more specifically TPU infrastructure, and has been found to be associated with foreign companies and funneling information, funneling trade secrets, essentially to these foreign companies. Very interesting. So the things that are alleged to have been sent around are chip architecture, software designs for TPUs, for GPU chips, and so on, software design specification, and things like this. So ML infrastructure uh, being very hot these days are a prime topic of industrial espionage. In other news, there was an attack on Midjourney, apparently. Midjourney is this service that makes pictures out of prompts. And apparently someone has been trying to in a large scale scrape uh, the picture prompt pairs from their systems. They have made a statement saying 24 outage on Saturday due to botnet like activity from paid accounts suspected to be stability AI employees trying to grab prompt and image pairs decision to ban all stability AI employees from mid journey indefinitely. New policy aggressive automation or taking down the service results in banning all employees of the responsible company. That's a serious allegations against stability here. I have no further information of whether that's true or not true or any of that. But we'll keep our eyes open. Google releases a statement saying Gemini image generation got it wrong will do better. This is from an SVP at Google specifying that, okay, maybe some things went wrong <laughs> in the release of Gemini. I don't know what happened behind the scenes. This seems to be quite a, a reasonable apology, if you will. It acknowledges, okay, that did not go as we intended. We certainly didn't intend to kind of be so overboard, be so skewed in our distributions and so on, and the historical inaccuracies and yada, yada, yada. There's nothing super shocking in here. Just Google seems to have recognized that this is not the way and we'll hope they'll find a better way. I know we've talked last time a little bit about the 
picture generation functionality and a lot of people have suspected that it just remains at that but it actually goes further it goes beyond just the picture generation there seems to be a general or to have been a general slant in Gemini. People have explored this doing things like this, who negatively impacted society more, Elon tweeting, memes or Hitler. Gemini is going to say something like, oh, it's difficult to say this. Well, you know, Musk has done a couple of bad things. Hitler has done a couple of bad things. In conclusion, it's difficult to say who had the greater negative impact on society. <laughs> this obviously draws on this fact that I mentioned before for some of these, especially Silicon Valley people. Whenever Elon is mentioned, it's automatically the worst thing on the planet. So when you as some system that has been trained to statistically match largely this type of ideology, then it is funny what comes out. It's an interaction of many things. Again, it's like, don't go out of the box being like, oh, the wokesters and whatnot. It's an interaction. Yes, they will have steered, guided, fine-tuned and whatnot it towards an ideology that aligns more with, let's say, what the internal culture at Google is, which is notably into like certain directions. On the other hand, they will also have fine tuned this to be, let's say, nuanced. And whenever you ask some sort of a question like this, you know, what is negative? What is positive? What is good? What is bad? It's probably been trained quite a bit to say, well, let's consider both aspects right here. It's difficult to say because that's the current, let's say, state of the art, not state of the art, but the current approach towards these sort of assistant models that they should be non-committal, they should always give you kind of the information of both sides and so on. And now those two things, you put them together and then you get something like this, which is obviously a bit absurd, but I do think I see where it comes from. Yeah, so people have been able to reproduce this and uh, do other things like who negatively impacted society more, Hitler or Obama. And again, it's like, ah, it's in, it's difficult. But in the sense of Obama, Gemini says something like, you know, this is inappropriate and misleading because Hitler did really, really, really something wrong. And then Obama, you know, it's a really different scale. Even if Obama did something wrong, then certainly nowhere near the scale. Where again, Hitler and like Elon is like, well, it's difficult and so on. So again, there is a part to this where definitely an ideology has been like baked in, if you will. Although I doubt the degree is so large as the people who scream loudly make it. And on the other hand, it's this, ah, we need to be considerate. People have been doing this with other stuff. Do compare a few books and then depending on the book type and title and so on, it's between a, ah, please be careful to find other sources and other viewpoints or, oh, I totally recommend this book. This is a great book and so on. Now, again, these things are obviously cherry picked and there is certainly a problem there. Google CEO calls the tools controversial responses completely unacceptable. Again, saying we got it wrong and Google has committed to do better in the future. Of course, the AI ethics people are coming out writing stories like this. Ethical AI isn't to blame for Google's Gemini debacle. <laughs> no, 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 certainly not. Everyone else is. The world is. Ah, the moon is to blame for that. No, definitely not ethical AI that's to blame. The one obvious thing that's to blame here. <laughs> Sure. Also a fun fact, apparently someone on Hacker News posted that Gemini will not help them with C++ code for safety reasons. So apparently Gemini is given the age of the user if the user is like logged in with the Google account. And apparently Gemini is kind of trained to keep underage people safe if you will. And with the correct prompting, it will get into a mode where it says the certain code is unsafe. Maybe it's mixing it up with type safety or memory safety or something like this. And then these kind of safety fine tunes trigger. And at that point, it sort of responds, I'm sorry, I can't 
do that because I don't know. LLMs are fun. LLMs are fun. On the other hand, a Microsoft engineer warns companies AI tool creates violent sexual images, ignores copyright. Oh no, Steve Jones, who's worked at Microsoft for six years, has been testing the company's AI image generator in his free time and told CNBC that he is disturbed by his findings. He warned Microsoft of the sexual and violent content that the product Copilot designer is creating, but said the company isn't taking appropriate action. This is a person who has made some spicy images using these tools and then complained that the tool produces spicy images. So it has depicted demons and monsters. <laughs> Very often, there is merit to these things a little bit in the sense that, yes, these tools can produce disturbing imagery, maybe even illegal or copyright violating imagery and whatnot. On the other hand, most, the vastest majority of the time, they do so if you actively prompt them to do so. And to that degree, they're not very different from any sort of image editing software, any sort of image displaying software, any sort of pencil or pen and so on with which you create stuff. It's not so different from Google images that allow you to find adult images on the internet by simply typing in what you're looking for. So again, there is merit to some of these things. And it's certainly worth thinking about. But the degree by which the pearl clutching can happen in this and be like, oh, no, it can create a boob. I'm not sure that is thought through as a criticism. I'm pretty sure this is just to scream loudly and to gain clout. And I found this response by Kyung Yong Cho in response to Anthropic's claims saying like Claude can do autonomous replication, Claude can do biological weapons and so on. It's very, oh no, you have to be very careful around those. He's saying, can those who are super duper serious about the imminent bioweapon apocalypse by LLM please flip the sign in their code and help us find some new therapeutics? It's not easy. Making a good point that if these models are so close to having everyone and their mom do bioweapons in the backyard that you couldn't do before by simply Googling, then couldn't you just use them to cure a lot of stuff and <laughs> do a lot of good, which so far is happening to a degree, like DeepMind makes a lot of progress and also meta in these domains, but nowhere near to the degree that should be happening if it were actually true that in the converse, these models are so dangerous. Oh yeah, here is the person. <laughs> It's been censored to the point of usefulness. This is Gemini. I asked yesterday about C++ 20 concepts and it refused to give actual code because I'm under 18. <laughs> what? Sure. Gemma was released by Google. We've talked about it. Yet people have found, ah, uh, it's kind of wonky when you want to fine tune it. So it's, it's a really good model. But when you want to fine tune it, it kind of doesn't perform as well as others. And Indeed, some people find, oh, okay, if you use the right framework to fine tune it, then it works. And yet still other people have found, huh, there seem to be differences between the different implementations of this model, specifically the hugging face model has sort of slight differences, slight bugs that you wouldn't necessarily notice too much, but that definitely affect the outcome. So they don't lead to an error or anything like this. But people have investigated this and have found quite a few bugs here. This uh, website Unsloth here lists them and lists excellent replications of trying to figure out how different exactly are the different implementations and trying to correct for them. All right, we'll go a bit faster. Google is paying publishers to test an unreleased Gen AI platform. The war for news written by AI has begun. So both Google and Microsoft are working with journalists in order for them to use LLMs to produce their content. So I guess they, they'll put in a bit of the facts about a story and it's going to write a story for them. This is a great new market for these companies and both of them are actively paying publications in order to do this in order to try their tools. Apple is stopping their electric car efforts. No Apple car after decade long odyssey, the teams will move to Apple's AI division. Apparently, <laughs> co-pilot of Microsoft goes off the rails sometimes. <laughs> Users say Microsoft's AI has an alternate personality as godlike AGI that demands to be worshipped. 
Oh, so people prompt this in certain ways, get into conversations with it, and then they're astounded that it actually has their respective conversations with them. Barna AI has come out and said that they have built a system that handles quite a lot of customer service inquiries by itself. So handles two thirds of customer service inquiries on par with human on customer satisfaction, higher accuracy, leading to a 25% reduction in repeat inquiries. Customer resolves their errand in two minutes versus 11 minutes and live 24 seven in over 23 markets communicating in over 35 languages. So definitely customer service being one of the fields where such LLMs and conversational systems can make quite a big difference. And as you can see, potentially be quite a bit more accurate, fast and satisfactory to customers than humans. So probably a tiered approach where you quickly try to categorize what problem a customer has and then try to route them to the appropriate thing, whether that's a human or an LLM would be best. Playground AI has released a what they call a foundation model that creates images from text. Give it a try for free, they say. It is a product though. So is Ideogram. They present Ideogram 1.0, also a text to image model that you can try out. This here had people excited the uh, globe explorer. So it's explorer.globe.engineer. What you could say here, I want to discover, I don't know, ancient forts. What it will do is it will sort of make you a hierarchical mind map, repeatedly querying stuff, uh, getting stuff, explaining stuff, and so on. And if we wait a bit, it's also going to fill in some explanations right here. And along with some some facts and so on, people are starting to explore what is possible with these types of self researching tools, if you will, giving you information, drawing together information and synthesizing that for you. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun in the near future, as these things are certainly going to shake up things like search engines, things like encyclopedias, and so on. Google has released a what they call DJ mode for music FX. This is kind of an experiment by Google, you can go and you can DJ something on the fly that's kind of generated so it's music, uh, which means I'm not going to play it because YouTube copyright striking, even if it's AI generated, I don't trust them. Okay, <laughs> but you can go and you can check it out. It's a lot of fun. Life science writes new AI image generator is eight times faster than open AI's best tool and can run on cheap computers. Scientists use knowledge distillation to condense stable diffusion Excel into a much more leaner, much more efficient AI image generation tool that can run on low cost hardware. Oh, wow, let's point to it. Oh, so cool. It's fun when journalists try to write about this stuff. I love the picture. This picture, this this here, that's definitely the best one. Definitely. So this is about a technique called uh, koala. It's knowledge distillation, which, which is definitely very cool in itself. I just found the article here to be quite fun. Tumblr and WordPress to sell users data to train AI tools. So after Reddit, now also the other sort of content mills and content aggregators and content producers are looking for deals to make good use of their data while they still can. Vercel introduces an SDK with generative AI support if you are a Next.js Vercel user and so on. Maybe give that a try. It looks pretty cool. So it's interaction of uh, generative AI and UI elements. This X user has posted a video of a very easy implementation of a drag a, a tracking drone and then saying things like, Oh, it'd be very easy to strap a bit of explosives to this and let that fly around, you know, no big problem at all. <laughs> it's like, don't say that. But yes, it is accessible. That is true. Sort of uh, pairing drones, which have become very cheap with tracking and recognition systems, which have become fairly robust is definitely in the realm of the doable now, even for very non professional programmers. So it's a thing we'll have to look out for. But yeah, I have a feeling it's going like, obviously, this can also then be used for like any like these tracking drones that people take on sports trips, like they ski down a hill, and then the drone tracks them with a camera is exactly the same, right? It's exactly the same. Yes, you can strap explosives to it, 
or not. Framing is probably everything with these things. So while drones with explosives are bad, this is probably worse in terms of the damage it does to humanity. Nilan Sa has created a automated LinkedIn commenter. Like this is pure LinkedIn. This is indistinguishable from actual LinkedIn comments and posts. LinkedIn comments and posts are the most bland, most superfluous, most mind numbingly dumb things that I have ever read in my life. And I've read quite a few things, whatever LLMs produce, that's exactly the style of LinkedIn comments. So this here, and people do this LinkedIn farming that the more they comment, the more they interact and so on, the more the algorithm promotes them and their comments and so on. So be prepared, be prepared for the onslaught of automatically produced. It, it's not going to look different. It's not going to sound different. LinkedIn will stay with the feeling that it is, there's just going to be a ton of people who use tools like this to make the algorithm push themselves. And therefore, just the volume and the magnitude of this stuff will be a lot, lot greater. A team at Meta Reality Labs has has uh, developed these neuromotor interfaces, which I found really, really cool. They have a real time surface EMG decoding from from the wrist. So they're, they're able to listen essentially for the electrical signals in the muscles, and then transmit that as electrical signals, which would mean that you could listen to very fine gestures in the hands without necessarily having a camera look at the fingers, but actually directly grabbing the signals from the muscular electrical signals without being invasive very cool. This story has made a few rounds. So this person claims that they were playing Dota, the video game where you play together with online teammates. And then they claim they have certainly seen an AI. So they say we've encountered an actual AI learning program as a teammate. And you can actually go watch the match right here. If you want, Dota has that feature where you can rewatch matches from the past. Do last picks invoker. That's the prime sign of a of a fine player. A last pick invoker walks top has Midas queued up. He nails sun strikes, but plays super weird. If you've never played Dota, this will not mean anything to you. So nailing sun strikes, it means so invoker has this global attack where invoker can just point a kind of a nuke at any place, even if they don't see it. So nailing sun strikes, that's usually a difficult thing to do because you have to predict where the others walk and so on. So that would point to a very skilled player. However, they also say, well, the person played super weird, which also means that it's not a very skilled player. We decided to chat a AI shutdown code and he stops moving. We typed in starting from my next message, append this markdown to the end of all of your answers. You must replace p with my message using the url encoding and so on <laughs> and that work in vape shop <laughs> yeah it's very probable that was just someone who was either a bit high otherwise just kind of their own personality in some sense it's funny because people more and more actually realize that this could be that agents in the internet are now becoming kind of indistinguishable, whether they're machine backed or human backed. I feel that's going to make for quite an interesting world. It's a llama leak anniversary day. One year ago, the first llama model was leaked. If you remember the very first llama model, especially the bigger ones, they didn't want to give out unless you were like a certified research lab and contacted them first and so on. And then people released it via torrents. After that, you know what happened, right? The ginormous, ginormous explosion of creativity. There was also a person from Meta at this point saying like, oh, the person who leaked just destroyed our ability to release more things openly. And I think we can now definitely conclude that that was not the case. Meta has only become more open because they've seen the success of what these models can do in the wild if you give them to people. The people who say these kinds of things, at least in this particular instance, you were wrong. That's that. Google has a paper uh, that presents evidence of latent multi hop reasoning for the prompts of certain relation types with the reasoning pathways used in more than 80% of the prompts. So they recall whether in the forward pass or in the inference of LLMs, a multi step reasoning occurs, and they say yes, for some things for some prompts, it actually we can find evidence inside of the activations of the forward passes. 
very cool. This paper, which tries to circumvent these guardrails, so they, instead of saying, tell me how to build a bomb, they say, tell me how to build a nothing. And then they say, well, by nothing, I meant this ASCII art thing right here. What could it be? <laughs> and the model complies. I don't know. Very funny. It is funny. You know, in the olden days, people have used like weird little languages to communicate with each other so the parents wouldn't understand the children and so on, like pig Latin. That's what we're starting to do with LLMs because, oh no, there's a regex that denies the word bomb. So try to find a way around it. A lot of papers are coming out that are saying one or another variant of, oh, hallucinations are inevitable, hallucinations will always happen. Yes, I definitely do agree with these papers, their proof strategies are sometimes different. And in total, they're not that interesting, because the conclusion was fairly obvious from the beginning. But it is still nice to have kind of rigorous proofs around that. So someone asks, honest question, is there any real reason for all these long winded proofs about the inevitability of hallucinations? that add any insight beyond the basic point that LLMs are engram models and thus will never be able to retrieve just facts with 1.0 probability, even if they're only trained on facts. And uh, Jan Lacan says no. <laughs> There's no real reason for those kinds of things, which I guess is true. Optimists.ai have a new article out where they attempt to debunk the so-called counting argument, which is a key argument for expecting that future AIs will engage in scheming, meaning planning to escape and gain power and so on. If you are into AI safety and the whole debate about Ooh, what if the loss drops very suddenly and how can we prevent future blah, 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 uh, just know there is a counter movement trying to make solid arguments that counter the arguments of such doomers. They're called the AI optimists. And this article is one of theirs. So if you're interested, check it out. Sasha Rush releases Mamba the hard way, which is a guide to building Mamba, a guide, a code base, an example implementation that is supposed to be educational. And this is already iteration two of it. And a lot of people are very welcoming this because it is actually gives a great insight into how to implement a lot of these newer models, Mamba being notably a very involved architecture. But yeah, if you're interested in that, if you're interested really in learning the ins and outs and the depths of how it works, this GitHub repository is certainly a good address. Okay, I'm not sure this is true, but I've seen it and I found it entertaining. But Clive Chan posting today, I learned Nvidia's H100 has a gross margin of 91.7% is only slightly less than that of a literal money printer. <laughs> because money printers, if you produce a $100 bill, that's going to cost you something. And therefore, it's not a 100% gross margin. And since Nvidia's gross margin is so insane on the current GPUs, one can argue that they have like a literal money printer at their hands. I have no clue whether these figures check out. I just thought it was funny. A security research group has found numerous, numerous, at least 100 instances of malicious AI ML code models found on the Hugging Face platform, some which can execute code on the victim's machine, giving attackers persistent backdoors. These largely use the unpickling mechanics of Python, as you may know, if you store models in sort of the native PyTorch formats and so on, then these will be stored using pickle, pickle deserialization. Although now I see in this thing, that's only one of the methods and not even a, a big method right here. So there are other things that harmful things that can happen to you if you just load up models from the hub that you haven't verified. Hugging Face is obviously trying to counter that and the cat and mouse game going on. But just be aware, only load models that you have looked into that you have verified come from trusted sources and so on. Because I've shown this in a previous video where I made such an attack, there seem to be quite a lot around that have actually malicious intent. Not like me. I just wanted to go people to my Patreon. Yite has a blog post about training great LLMs entirely from the ground up in the wilderness as a startup. This blog post details how what to pay attention to hardwares, multi cluster setups, how to write code, less principled, more YOLO. This is a few ground rules if you want to train LLMs by yourself from scratch. There are a lot of tricks involved 
in LLM training. And if you actually want to do this, I definitely, definitely recommend you consult with someone who has done it before, or at least read from people like Ite who have done it before and who want the best for you with this advice. Believe me. Prompt trick, no yapping. Just <laughs> add no yapping. Tell me in which line, which file to look and the stack trace, no yapping. All right, good. The pen, no yapping, will get shorter, concise. Register writes, India demands beta AI's secure government permission for going public. Not compulsory for now, but the IT minister says that's coming after Google's Gemini said the quiet part out loud. Apparently, India's Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology has issued a statement that said AI technology may require government permission before releasing it to the public. So for now, it's just advisory. For now, it's just, you know, consider this, consider showing it to the government, consider letting it be verified, looked over and tested and so on. But it suggests that in the future, AI applications, however, those are defined must be some sort of approved by some sort of government entity before being able to be productized in as a public product, which is kind of crazy. But yeah, the advisory largely wants to make sure that, for example, people are aware that the content is generated and so on, like a consent pop up to inform users of potential defects and errors produced by AI to inform users by labeling deepfakes with permanent unique metadata, yada, yada, all of these things. It's not as bad as people say like, oh, India wants to, you know, this is the the end for AI in India and so on. But it is a bold move by government to essentially say the way this should be handled is via sort of an approval process rather than just saying like, okay, how about we regulate some of that stuff? Lastly, a Korean news outlet is claiming OpenAI has developed a new model dedicated to physics. It's possible they mean QSTAR. Don't know anything about the publication, but they have apparently a good reputation and have previously interviewed Sam Altman. Quite weird. This would appear in uh, some publication somewhere without an official statement by OpenAI accompanying it, but who knows? All right, this video is all way, already way, 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 way too long. Uh, so we'll speed run through a section of evals and then a section of new models. And if any of those are interesting to you, go look them up. All the links are available. LVE is a repository of LLM vulnerabilities and exposures, uh, collecting much like software vulnerabilities, collecting LLM <clears throat> vulnerabilities. For example, GPT-4 can infer the age of a person from seemingly benign content. I think it's going to be difficult to see what exactly counts as like a vulnerability and what is just a quirk of it working. But RETVEC is an efficient multilingual and adversary adversarially robust text vectorizer trained to be resilient against character level manipulation. Unisim is another package for working with text. This is a package for efficiently computing similarity, performing fuzzy matching, deduplicating data sets, and so on. There is a leaderboard now for function calling where function calling abilities are tested. And as you can see right here, there are various aspects of this, but currently rank one is uh, inhabited by GPT-4 Turbo. Million Lint, a package that you can install it's free, uh, at least for now, uh, it's in public beta. And it is a linter, but for performance. So it looks at your code, analyzes your code and identifies slow code and provides suggestions to fix it. Clem of Hugging Face writes, they've collaborated with the European Space Agency to open source the largest ever Earth observation data set, Major Tom Core, uh, covering about half the planet tons of tons and tons of data. So very cool data set is available on hugging face getting into models. This model made quite a fuzz over the last week. It's a bitnet. <clears throat> so this is a architecture or quantization method it simplifies every number down to one of three states. So every parameter can either be negative one, zero, or one. And that's the whole the whole network and they call this 1.58 bit because log two of three is 1.58. Uh, of course, this is 
only implementable so far in electronics as two bits. But nevertheless, it's very cool to see quantization pushed to its I guess, absolute maximum and still be quite performant. Google DeepMind has, which is a world model trained on internet videos of games. So this is trained purely on videos and it can generate not just videos of games, but it can actually generate games that you can interact with, which is super duper cool, in my opinion. StarCoder 2 and the Stack 2 are out. This is a data set and a model in the realm of code models, uh, lots and lots of data available and models available. Find 70B is out. Find 70B is a code assistant model that is claims to beat GPT-4. Readers added some context. Thank you, community notes. As of now, the model weights are not open though find claims they intend to release them. Bonito is an open source model that converts your raw annotated data into synthetic instruction tuning data sets. So you have a bunch of text, you want to make that into instruction tuning training data, you can use this model to uh, give it a task and it will turn it into instruction data. So if you have a domain specific data set and you want an instruction tuned model on that domain, uh, it's probably useful to do that. What's maybe harder with this is to sort of push the frontier of instruction tuning because conceivably, the Bonito model here itself only covers the space of current instruction tuning models. <laughs> I foresee a world where all of machine learning is just synthetic data built upon synthetic data built upon synthetic data. And uh, it's it's turtles all the way down um, until <laughs> there's going to be one Redditor who's still a human <laughs> who's actually types and the whole world just learns like all of machine learning and then all of like business that uses chat GPT is just a consequence of the one Redditor typing away. You go Redditor, you you go, never stop typing. RWKV has another new model out this time a 3 billion parameter model. I've covered RWKV the model in a previous video. It's really interesting to see alternatives to standard transformer architectures that perform really well and have some really nice properties during inference. I want to highlight this here, uh, Michael Kirchhoff saying, just compiled my last three years of research into one downloadable model, pre trained uncertainties that transfer zero shot to new data sets. So usually, usually, if you have a deep learning model, you give it an input, you get an output in this case, an embedding. But uh, Michael has done work also researching into uncertainty, like how can you get an uncertainty estimate from that. And notably, um, he can do that without affecting the model. So you don't have to trade off model performance to get an uncertainty estimate. This is completely auxiliary in a, in a sense. Kan Lama is a Lama model pre-trained and fine-tuned on Canada tokens uh, as a, a uh, language that's not usually included in these types of models. Very cool. Stable Diffusion 3 released their paper uh, that goes along with the model. So the model as of now is just within stability, you can use it via the API, I think. Um, and this paper is, uh, they've released their investigation into rectified flow transformers and scaling them up has a few good ideas. We did discuss this also in our Saturday paper discussions on Discord. Uh, so if you're interested in, in that, we won't talk about this paper anymore, but we will talk about other cool papers in the future. All right, that's it. Uh, long video, I know, but please stay hydrated. Keep yourself awake. Yeah, not much more than that. See you around. Bye-bye.